Great. Well, uh, thanks very much. For those of you that don't know, know Minneapolis Dave Simpson, a uh, career in the Navy, uh, and in, uh, a number of joint assignments. I was fortunate enough to uh, serve uh, in every continent uh, around the world at one point or another, uh, and lived in a different country with, with my family, uh, and uh, finished up in my last two tours uh, as the J6 for General Ray Aaron and John Austin uh, in Iraq, uh, and uh, really greatly uh, enjoyed and learned from not only the uh, responsibility of doing communications for U.S. and coalition forces in Iraq, uh, but uh, helping to develop the capabilities across the Iraqi government uh, to have, have them succeed in uh, by, uh, improving their communications between each of the ministries uh, in uh, their national uh, local and community governments. Uh, but the final third was uh, probably the most exciting and most relevant to what I'm doing at the FCC. I was charged with bringing the ICT economy to life uh, and uh, really developing what is now, well, what was the number one revenue source, their second greatest revenue source is IT, uh, which is uh, really appropriate for Iraq given uh, their history is really a, a relatively educated uh, population, and they certainly aspire to um, uh, get back to, to the main and great uh, eons ago. Uh, but a tough road for them to hope. Uh, and most recently, at the vice director of DISA, uh, where I uh, executed about the $10 billion a year in IT spend, which uh, is what uh, Phil Revere, who was Ambassador Revere for the State Department, uh, when he was working with Chairman Wheeler to put together his new leadership team for the FCC, that attracted Phil to me, uh, and uh, Phil told the chairman, hey, uh, that guy knows a little bit about the uh, industry because that $10 billion is all around the world with uh, governments that uh, all regulate in different ways. Uh, and uh, get some experience you want to draw upon, and in particular, uh, because Chairman Miller wanted to bring cyber alive uh, at the commission, uh, uh, that was what uh, really caused uh, the chairman to uh, ask me to have lunch with him, which is how these things start, right? Uh, and uh, uh, from uh, that lunch in October, from December on, I've been working uh, as the head of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau within the Commission, which includes the cybersecurity responsibility, uh, and that's the responsibility to bring cyber uh, into all of the bureaus and offices uh, at the Commission. Uh, so uh, that's a, and that has been an exciting remit for me, and I hope today to talk a little bit about that. Um, I uh, uh, am so happy to see veterans from virtually every service here, so uh, I We'll start off with the uh, Oprah and, and Huya and uh, uh, a, a, a Huya uh, or uh, uh, Hua, uh, and a and Amaya. Thanks. <laughs> uh, uh, I'd like this to be interactive, so please, uh, you know, feel free to, to this smaller group. You can stop me at any time uh, to maybe explore a little bit more about uh, an item, uh, and or if you like, at the end, what I'd like to do is maybe talk a little bit about how the FCC is organized to help facilitate how each of your companies or your departments or agencies uh, might better leverage what the FCC does, uh, a little bit about our charter and, and what's uh, big on our plates today. Um, uh, this is the first time I've been with ACT ISC, so thank you for uh, inviting me. I applaud that your efforts to uh, expand the dialogue beyond just our uh, individual stovepipes. It's just so important that we move forward uh, that uh, we can do that. Uh, we've increasingly seen emerging technologies are really less emerging and more commonplace every day. There are now more wireless phones in America than there are people. And by the end of 2014, the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU, says that this will be true on a worldwide basis. Consider that for a moment, if you think about it. More cell phones on the planet than there are people. 
Uh, it's an amazing thing. Uh, an estimated 60% of those phones today are smartphones. So it's not just the brother color people. It's this conduit into big data for individuals. Uh, it is uh, just amazing what we've done with it, but even more amazing potential for it. Uh, everything from uh, being able to have a cup of joe at Starbucks, to health and safety apps that uh, uh, will help extend all of our lives to uh, public safety applications that will uh, support your ability to call 911 and get help uh, should you really need it and literally save your life. As these advanced technologies are embraced by consumers in the commercial marketplace, they create both challenges and opportunities for public safety and for us in our regulatory capacity. We need to ensure that our core public safety functions continue to be served as technology changes, and we need to look for every opportunity to bring public safety leverage to, uh, should help public safety leverage those new technologies to serve the public more effectively and more cost effectively. Today, I'd like to highlight some of the areas in which my bureau uh, and the Commission at large are actively pursuing uh, emerging new technology. The key issue for the Commission include uh, enhancing the reliability of the nation's legacy 911 infrastructure and supporting the rapid transition to next generation 911. The important role of learning has uh, in emergency preparedness. Uh, we all, at some point, I'm sure in your lives, have heard the following is a broadcast of the emergency alerting system. Uh, standards for wireless location accuracy. Uh, FCC efforts to support the deployment of FirstNet nationwide interoperable public safety broadband network. The transition of the nation's commercial infrastructure from legacy switch network, TDN, PSTN, to an all IP environment. And the commission's increased focus on cybersecurity. All of these have a common thread, transition. I mean, a useful picture for what we want to do in support of that transition is a key component for getting there in a way that does not place enduring values at risk. For the Commission, uh, there are four enduring values that really underpin what it is we do. Uh, the first enduring value is uh, consumer protection and, and ensuring that that's preserved as the landscape of telecommunications changes. The uh, second is uh, universal access, and that's that communications won't just be where there are markets, that we will have communications wherever we have people. Uh, and that's a, a, a very, it was a very important thing when the commission was first started, that concept that we would as a nation commit to getting the telegraphs and the uh, telephone systems out to wherever we had people at a farmhouse in Kansas would get a phone. Uh, it's just as topical today as we debate as a nation, uh, should we have uh, the free market uh, drive where broadband goes and have broadband follow where there aren't uh, market uh, forces that would bring high-speed internet to those locations, or should Broadband, should that access to the internet superhighway be universal? Should it be wherever we have people? Uh, it, it's uh, uh, something that uh, you have probably followed the, the significant debate uh, around that issue today, and the uh, commission is working hard on that right now. Uh, the third area is really uh, my area it's public safety, uh, and that. Uh, in providing communications, uh, there's uh, a significant um, public resource uh, to communications, right? There's only so much spectrum to go around. So if you want to make money in communications, you've got to get a license uh, to, to use most of the spectrum in the commercial side. Uh, where we've uh, authorized unlicensed use of spectrum, it's been it done very cautiously to uh, have uh, the minimum barriers for that, but there are still um, uh, rules, regulations, and responsibilities for one how how one even uses unlicensed spectrum. If uh, you want to 
do submarine communications or submarine cables uh, off of our shores. You've got to get a license for that uh, because there's a right of way that you have to, uh, a public right of way that, that you're going to use. If you're going to do satellite communications, uh, uh, Lucius, uh, you've got to um, have a, a, a license because there are only so many orbital slots uh, that are useful for that. And similarly, the, the rights of way for where uh, copper and fiber optic cables go are uh, public resources. With the utilization of those public resources comes a responsibility, a shared responsibility to uh, keep America safe. And communications are a critical component uh, for that. Uh, and the Commission has always had a role in ensuring that that public responsibility uh, it, it is met. The file area, uh, you're in. Can I ask a question? You talked about spectrum, you talked about spectrum sharing. <laughs> Obviously, Congress has allocated you know, the 700E block for FirstNet. Um, the AWS three uh, auctions are the next ones. Uh, Tara Takai's office gave up you know, DOD spectrum uh, to pair with FCC spectrum for that auction, 1755 and uh, 1855. Um, you know, spectrum is a scarce resource, right? God, stop making it. And um, there's a lot of talk right now about spectrum sharing. And the constructs of that are either geographic or time-based, right? And I don't know if we're ready for true time-based spectrum sharing because the cognitive technologies aren't quite there yet. What is your opinion coming from the DOD? Because you know the DOD has very critical mission sets with radar systems, et cetera, that are that are ultimately part of our homeland defense architecture. And as we get commercial pressure for the DOD to give that spectrum up. Or to the wireless carriers, um, what is your opinion on spectrum sharing geographically? And do you think that um, the Department of Defense should get access to commercial spectrum on federal lands? It's a, it's a great question, Randy. Uh, and uh, I do not think a circle the wagons approach around spectrum is going to result in as powerful a military as we need to have to. Um, execute responsibly, effectively around the world. Uh, I think it's myopic uh, and uh, not reflective of the reality of how we fight and win and are uh, challenged overseas. Uh, uh, Al uh, may remember from, from uh, Yukon how we had an acquisition uh, structure in our military that uh, built weapon systems in the United States, and it, it boggled the mind regularly on how uh, the systems would be built around spectrum allocations in the United States without any conception of all of the spectrum allocations around the rest of the world. So this thing that was designed to be expeditionary and global, and you had glossy ads everywhere about uh, you know this system is going to. Uh, have America be able to fight and win around the world, we'd bring it to Germany and you couldn't use it. You could not use it. We don't own, no matter how much we'd like to think, spectrum allocations all around the world. We're a more effective military. Our nation has a more effective military if we can flexibly use the spectrum that's there uh, and not uh, lock ourselves into fixed allocations that uh, either uh, we can't gain those allocations. Try gaining an allocation for spectrum use from your adversary. <laughs> you know, they, they're not going to get it. Uh, and so a, a fixed use of spectrum just becomes a target uh, uh, for the adversary, which is getting better and better in their ability to jam. So I think just fundamentally, from a military standpoint, learning how to be agile in spectrum, uh, learning how to share, and being effective in that sharing, uh, has not only useful uh, efficiency value uh, in our own country domestically, but it has huge uh, operational value uh, overseas in allowing us then to operate in the spectrum environment that we find, not the one we wish we had. Uh, so, uh, you know, from the characterization of your question may not be the answer that you'd like, uh, but uh, I uh, am here to tell you we have some spectrum utilization in DOD that is 
yeah, an embarrassingly low data throughput for the band with the sign. Uh, do we need to pressurize that? I personally think we do, and I think we'll be a more powerful military, a more powerful uh, uh, group of uh, uh, Homeland Security agencies uh, when we can get to a more um, flexible uh, use of spectrum resources. So I'd like to ask you to flip that now. Let's come to Homeland Security, public sector, safety. Sure. They have their own issues with with uh, interoperability of the radios and the you know DHS puts up repeaters so that they can use some wireless. So there are all kinds of communications issues. It's the 700 hertz radios or somewhere. They for years been trying to come to some standards. What are you seeing in that area? One of the major pushes around the country. It it's a, a difficult challenge because uh, I, I thought. The patchwork quilt of governance in DOD was hard. <laughs> then I got public safety communications, <laughs> and uh, it, you know, just the who gets the side piece is uh, really uh, very um, fragmented. Uh, and uh, the FCC has jurisdiction over pieces of it uh, at states and and uh, their commissions and. It's, uh, the communication commission, sometimes it's the utility commission, sometimes it's the emergency communications commission, uh, have a jurisdiction over another piece of it. Uh, and in some states, they've actually delegated that down to the county level. Uh, and then the decision to procure product uh, or radios uh, and other things that would admit um, is, tends to be much more of a local uh, uh, decision. Uh, uh, yet we're trying to do this first step thing, which is uh, has national. Uh, backing behind it. Uh, so it's a very exciting landscape right now uh, and a difficult one to, to, to work through. Um, you've got the traditional last mile uh, emergency communications that tend to be uh, uh, LMR, landmill radio. Um, and just within landmill radio, uh, there have been significant interoperability issues that many of you know about. Uh, the, um, P25 standard, uh, Tetra, um, and uh, it, uh, I, whether it's the interest of companies to uh, ensure that while we have open standards, that the implementations are just proprietary enough, where those open standards really don't work so well unless you go all one uh, vendor uh, or, or another vendor. Uh, or, or if it's just the, the uh, very different legitimate approach to how to get most bang for the buck over the spectrum, it, you know, there's a little bit of truth in all of that. Uh, that uh, is there in the land mobile radio piece. Uh, then there's the emerging uh, opportunity with FirstNet to look at the wonderful. Um, rapid propagation of cellular capabilities that have steadily advanced from 2G to 3G to 4G to LTE uh, and say, well, hey, that's a nice way to chop up the spectrum. Let's uh, use LTE for that. Uh, the public safety community, uh, when you get down to the, the uh, fire chief or the police chief level, um, they, they kind of are wary of the um, excitement some have about well, let's just jump into LTE uh, because they have so much experience in the LMR world that well it's got some imperfections it's the devil you know versus the devil you don't know uh, and uh, there are characteristics that LTE uh, in its commercial cyber implementation doesn't um, uh, directly address uh, like the peer-to-peer um, uh, -peer, uh, communications, the uh, ability to uh, bring it into buildings uh, where you don't necessarily have uh, antenna coverage. Uh, so uh, the public safety community is working through the, how to navigate that way ahead. Uh, and in my bureau, we're working to balance the how do we continue to improve the efficient use in the LMR bands uh, while we support 
uh, the Department of Commerce and the FirstNet Corporation in uh, ultimate attainment of the uh, FirstNet objective, uh, uh, which I truly believe will be a game changer. Uh, and uh, it, it's very exciting. But we can't um, introduce undue risk uh, in that transition. These are systems that have to work all the time, every time, for the agencies uh, and David, can you expand a little bit as far as your role within FirstNet and, and FCC's interests? Sure. Uh, uh, first, most broadly, uh, the FCC is charged with raising the money uh, for FirstNet. Uh, so that's uh, going to be done through the auction of Spectrum. Uh, and we're working through something called the, the uh, it's going to be a reverse auction uh, where the broadcasters today for broadcast television will, uh, and, and Jane, hit me if I get it too wrong, um, will be able to sell their existing spectrum and then they'll be able to bid uh, with a, another group of uh, companies interested in uh, the new spectrum so that there can be a repacking uh, that would uh, uh, allow contiguous spectrum to be uh, made available for other uses. Um, that the money generated from that should be in the billions of uh, uh, dollars category. And the legislation for FirstNet said that, okay, FCC, you'll, you'll give that money to the FirstNet Corporation so they can get uh, the FirstNet network up and running. Uh, a key point there is so that you can get it up and running. They paint no new money, no sustainment money for FirstNet. They've got to uh, be able to generate the revenue for the continued operations of that national network from sharing a spectrum uh, and figuring out how, probably with LTE, to uh, work the uh, quality of service uh, uh, oriented scheme that would, uh, our schema that would allow uh, first responders, uh, public safety communications to get first priority uh, over that spectrum uh, and to then make available the resources that aren't used by that dynamically for uh, commercial use, which is why I believe FirstNet will uh, start with a hey, list. Get the data part right. Let's not um, uh, destroy what we know works today in the LMR world with regard to voice communication. Uh, in that time, we expect voice over LTE and multi uh, to uh, mature in the commercial cellular market. Uh, and there may be a time where uh, that voice comes into the LTE environment for FirstNet, uh, but the data part alone is going to be really hard. <laughs> so let's pick that part right. Uh, a lot of challenges uh, with FirstNet, uh, and the FCC is assigned additionally a consultative role with the FirstNet Corporation to uh, help the corporation succeed. And so I believe that translates to I'm directed to help uh, FirstNet TJ Kennedy and the um, new uh, Chairman Sue Swenson be uh, radically successful in everything they do uh, and, and help them as they ask for the help. Not to presume that we've got the right answer and say, hey, this is what you need to do, Sue, or this is what you need to do, TJ. It's the, hey, TJ, Sue, I'm here. How can, how can I be helpful? Uh, and the FCC has a lot of things they can be helpful with. You know, we uh, have folks that are uh, good, well steeped in the valuation spectrum. Uh, so we can help them as they develop their business plan for how to sustain uh, the network. We have uh, a lot of engineering expertise in the uh, architectures associated with communications uh, and a uh, uh, robust um, regular engagement with the public safety community all the way down to local PSAPs, the public safety answering points, uh, that uh, uh, we can help the, and are helping the uh, FirstNet folks with. Um, 
I just had a phone call from TJ last week uh, uh, to say about uh, once a month um, at my level, uh, we uh, uh, communicate very constructively with them uh, and uh, at lower levels of my staff that uh, communication is even more frequent. Uh, does that answer the question? So, um, as far as partnerships go, uh, first responders, yes, their systems must work. When you start doing everything over IP and you want to do cellular use first step, it seems like that kind of opens you up to other critical infrastructure industries, right? Power, utilities, which are in a lot of cases also run by special districts around the country. Is there any is there any effort to engage those folks to get some groundswell going, reports and yeah, it's a great question. Uh, there are 16, DHS has identified 16 critical infrastructure sectors, uh, communication being one of those. But the other 15, and all of them tell you that, that 16, that's kind of work. That's fundamental to my success uh, as a, a, an industry, as uh, utilities. Um, so there's a huge interdependence uh, that uh, increasingly will, will rely on the fact uh, or will rely on the internet protocol and how we implement the internet protocol for long law communications to uh, uh, work. Uh, and it's, it again goes back to uh, a, a lot of uh, the debate today around net neutrality and around IP tech transition. Um, the uh, internet um, protocol use for communication has to this point been managed in the information services side of our um, regulatory framework uh, as opposed to switch communications which have been Title II um, uh, managed uh, as common carrier services. Yes, yes. Yeah, so for, for, for Al, common carriage goes back to the old days of, of Roads, toll roads, uh, and uh, uh, railroads are another good example where, in fact, if the public said, look, we're going to be able to make money, Mr. Toll Road Operator, you've got to treat everybody equally. Uh, and if uh, somebody comes and says, hey, I want to use the toll road to uh, uh, take rum down your, your highway, uh, just because you're a debt road owner also happens to be a whiskey owner, uh, of a whiskey company, you can't let the not let the rum trucks go through. Um, probably not the best uh, uh, analogy. Hey, well, it works. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this early morning day. Um, uh, it, it, when you bring that to communications, uh, we have under common carriage law said that for uh, telephony uh, that hey, you, you can't discriminate. You can't block. Uh, and you need to be transparent, uh, as well as a number of other protections, including availability uh, and what the um, reliability has to be for your operation of that whole road, your operation of the communication path. Uh, that had been prescriptively uh, regulated under Title II for, for uh, decades. Um, as the internet came up, we said that the FCC made a conscious decision that, look, look let's not. Um, let's bias towards innovation uh, and let's let that uh, uh, grow uh, as the market drives it with a very loose uh, uh, kind of um, oversight uh, that uh, cheers industry on. Uh, essentially, that was operated as a best level of effort service. Uh, if it worked, great. If it doesn't, hey, the market will figure it out and somebody will invent something better. and. Uh, it, it will uh, uh, be better next year uh, when that next invention comes out. Uh, folks are asking now uh, uh, around the nation, that's kind of the heart of the net neutrality uh, debate, is what got us here going to get us there? As we look at the sunset uh, switch services, the time division multiplex service, the PSDN, the you know, POTS uh, uh, telephone service, managed prescriptively by communities in that 
patchwork governance that I talked about uh, in a way that said, look, I need that nine one call to go through. It's got to be there every time, all the time. I need that first responder to be able to be dispatched. Uh, I, I need uh, the entire community to be supported, not just uh, you know half the community. Um, as those legacy uh, communication services are uh, sunset, uh, and those functions come over to the everything over IP world, uh, is there a higher standard uh, that uh, needs to be applied uh, higher than just best level of service? I, I think from a public safety perspective, at least for those public safety functions where now the communications for uh, uh, police departments and for fire departments and up to uh, uh, the agencies that are charged with Homeland Security, uh, uh, FBI, Coast Guard, and FEMA, you name it, that uh, best on leather effort, yeah, try, you know, I, 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 I thought I had a good uh, mesh. Uh, I'm not sure that's going to uh, support us with the reliability, the resiliency, the robustness that uh, we need to uh, have in a predictive and proactive manner. So does that mean Title II? Um, I'm not saying that. Does that mean 706, uh, which is where information services are managed now? Uh, I, I don't know. That's why we have a, a lot of lawyers uh, in the other bureaus and offices that, uh, working through that today. Uh, and I'm that, that regular uh, burr in the saddle that says, hey, wait. We can't put America at risk uh, by uh, having uh, best level effort service for public safety communications. We need to have it there when it's needed. There was a major outage about uh, two months ago uh, in Washington State. Remember anybody read about that? A couple folks did. Uh, for six hours, uh, no one could call 911 in Washington State. And, and literally, seven states around it were impacted to a lesser degree, uh, but they couldn't call 911, not because something failed in Washington State, not because the central office had a malfunction or some bad code uh, in the central office that supported Portland or, 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 or New York State, Seattle. Uh, it was a lookup table hosted on a server in Colorado that had as a backup a additional database in Miami uh, that had a very manual failover process uh, and it was operated not by the carrier uh, providing the local phone service in Washington but by a third party 911 uh, provider. Uh, the interdependencies, as you start to get out in the living and right world, are huge uh, in the risk uh, management between companies and with communities. Uh, not well understood, not well defined, and in some cases just not done. Uh, and uh, it turns out that there was a shortfall in a module in that to code for that particular lookup. Uh, table. And, and I, I should caveat that that's provisional. I, I will get the deep dive uh, investigation uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, but uh, it could have just as easily been malware uh, injected by an adversary wanting to amplify the impact of the physical attack or wanting to sow the seeds of um, doubt in government uh, because they can't even call for help anymore. You know, they, uh, uh, we, we have not, in public safety, had the kind of um, focus on cybersecurity that uh, uh, the intelligence community, the DOD, and DHS have had nationally. So uh, that's a huge concern for us as we have this inexorable march to everything over IP. At the same time as we're sun sunsetting switched, uh, as we are uh, 
significantly increasing society's utilization of um, IP communications. It, you know, it's not just everything over IP. It's now the Internet of Things <laughs> using IP. It, you know, your refrigerator is, is a part of the net now. So we have this greatly expanded tax service, greatly adapted way to generate an impact in the other critical uh, infrastructure sectors uh, that uh, needs to be uh, protected. And uh, who protects and what part of the protection is their responsibility? That's very gray right now. Um, so uh, uh, we'll work hard on that. I, I've kind of strayed from the question. I do want to come back to cyber uh, and what we're doing, but did they answer the question? Um, it more than answers it and... Well, more than answers it in a bad way? Or <laughs> no, no, it more than answers it in a good way. Um, and I'm still just kind of curious about first step, or is there an opportunity to engage those folks in something like first step, or is it not? Yeah, no, it, absolutely, because that money, the billions of dollars, uh, it, it hasn't hit them yet, right? So they haven't really completed the, the plan for uh, how are they going to spend that. Uh, and uh, Secretary Pitzker, that's that line? No, it's Pritzker, I'm sorry, uh, for the Department of Commerce has told the personal corporation, look, you're not getting a whole lot of additional money or staff in help. So I see a business plan that I'm ready to endorse. So uh, that hasn't been endorsed yet, uh, and they really haven't um, fully developed their execution plan. So I think there's a huge opportunity for companies in the next two years uh, as the business plan is endorsed, as the first net corporation then staffs up and works the implementation. And I think there's a significant opportunity for the companies that have traditionally supported uh, DOD, VIC, and DHS to bring that expertise into the FirstNet world. I, I'll tell you, when you go to talk to a police chief or a fire chief about FirstNet, they very much have an LMR focus and they'll uh, build out uh, uh, from there uh, and then talk to you about how we would then federate that uh, uh, between communities. But they really don't have significant experience at scale uh, as you begin to connect things in any kind of a federation on what that means to accepted risk uh, and what that means to, uh, okay, are you hard who you said you are uh, on that network? I think the biggest near term need uh, is an identity management structure for FirstNet uh, that has cyber baked into it um, so that we uh, can uh, authoritatively uh, identify who is who in that uh, public safety communications zoo from local all the way up to top uh, with an ability then to do attribute-based access control that would say, okay, at certain times, uh, we need the fire chief to have the top priority. But when the disaster occurs, I, I, I want that lowest level sergeant, you know, on beat patrol, who's there at the scene, to get the number one priority. And I kind of want his video to, to come out maybe ahead of somebody else's voice. Yeah, so uh, voice yeah, so the prioritization of service uh, is. You know, I can kind of get people there and they say, yeah, of course we go to the old private service in that temporal kind of way. But then when I go to, okay, but let's talk about identity management, the public safety communications eyes kind of glaze over because they, they, they just don't have a lot of experience in uh, doing that at scale. Um, so I, I think that's a significant challenge and, and a, a role for companies that have traditionally supported uh, DHS, DOD, and IC to potentially come into that, that personal environment and uh, uh, help with an architecture that's designed from the top down, but can support uh, policy decisions that are made locally, uh, dynamically, uh, in, in a common frame. Do you feel that the um, data standards and the approach to mean is helping uh, because you can have a great network, but the the boundaries are blurred, clearly we all get that. The software-defined networks is a little blurry, further we don't know what's going. 
more importantly, to get to the data to the first responder for respondents and really doing the level of what you're just saying, are, are you feeling that the, the, um, the approach to me, I mean, I think us in the private sector are happy to have standards. We like standards. Standards help us focus yeah. into what we need to build to and design on. But how do you feel? Are, are people generally familiar with me, uh, Senator Paul's uh, effort? Uh, in, in general, yes, I think that I mean, has a very good approach and that it's, it has recognized that, um, okay, the minute you get the communications piece down for the, the information exchange, you very soon rapidly go into almost every other uh, critical infrastructure sector and then even beyond that. Uh, that. So, means very um, uh, broad-based <coughs> approach to let's develop standards uh, on, on, on all four. Um, where the devil gets in the details is, you know, Neem is attempting a very broad, broad-based approach at these things, uh, and uh, it doesn't have the granularity often uh, with, to the product level uh, to uh, generate interoperability that, uh, that um, that holds true to the aspirations of NEAM uh, and the governance of uh, NEAM versus the subordinate implementations of NEAM uh, has been challenging. You know, who's, who's the boss of NEAM uh, when it comes to implementation of NEAM? Uh, so, uh, yes, NEAM, but it's hard uh, and the devil's in the details and it's uh, a proof that doesn't buy into these things. Uh, I, my role now, I think, is to help illuminate the importance of standards in this area, to work with NIST and try to get them to uh, uh, be proactive and potentially to uh, hold uh, workshops that would bring the communities together uh, and be for them at that. Is, is that? Yeah. I'll I, I, I this question here. Tony, is Yeah, we've. Um, We've been taking a particular interest in, um, um, in our company in um, playing a role in the NG911 development. We've seen a lot of that activity in the Northeast, frankly. Is it spreading across the country? Missouri seems a little bit interested in it, but it, it doesn't seem to be flowing west and south as much as uh, we, had, uh, we had hoped. Let me answer a question for me. In Missouri, are they saying, show me? <laughs> no, no, no. They're showing. They're, they're saying. We're we'll thinking, show you. Yeah, right. oh, yeah. uh, great question. <laughs> Ours is too. Yeah. yeah. Um, I visit. I try to make it uh, a practice to visit a piece half a month, and at least uh, on every trip I take, uh, I carve out time to go uh, visit the, the piece half. The last piece half I was in was in Clark County, Nevada. Uh, which is the county that serves Las Vegas, and it was the day before Clyde Bundy had his standoff with the, uh, the uh, 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 management folks there. Yeah, so uh, it was really uh, it made that whole crisis a little more real to me, knowing the, some of the communicators uh, in Clark County that were supporting that. Um, a huge variation in. Uh, not just the capabilities within the different piece apps. There's 6,400 of these entities, all with uh, significant um, empowerment to make their own decisions on what they buy, what they right. use, how they integrate. Um, and the, the commission, my bureau is uh, charged with kind of ocean. Ocean is a sailing term. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ocean them along. Uh, uh, towards a um, uh, more uh, effective, uh, efficient uh, uh, path, but in a way that preserves their uh, build of local communities to make local decisions about what they do next. An example of that is text to 911. We just passed a, a rule is in February uh, that uh, now says that carriers have to be able to support uh, text 911, uh, and four major carriers have done that. They last month finished all the work and they can support wherever a piece app wants to use text 911, uh, uh, they're ready to support that. Uh, the over the top providers, the interconnected VoIP, uh, uh, we're 
uh, challenging them to do it by the end of this year. Uh, and we will evaluate them, and if they haven't gotten there, you know, you expect this to raise the temperature a bit on the over-the-top folks, because if you're, if you're going to buy dial tone and supporting call to a number, uh, then uh, to, to me, you're providing a public service for communications that needs to be used useful in that call for help. Uh, so um, they, they, that will also apply then to um, text. The PSAPs uh, are naturally in a lag position. Right? They're on shoestring budgets, uh, many of them, most of them. Uh, they're not going to uh, get uh, authorization to invest and upgrades necessary to consume and use text 911 until the capability is there. Uh, for them to actually uh, buy it. So it, it, it's there for the four big ones, uh, which is the, the predominant uh, uh, support for 901. Uh, and they're beginning to make uh, the decisions around how to use it. I would agree with your characterization that in the Northeast, kind of Virginia on up, uh, there's a, a much um, either a tighter linkage to the plans that the telcos have to uh, bring these capabilities to bear so that there's been parallel planning uh, uh, publicly for that. Uh, or, or maybe it's just a different uh, uh, demographic, a different uh, use uh, out west. Uh, but we are getting uh, universally a, a, a demand signal for this. Um, California has been really an anomaly uh, in that characterization. Uh, they're pushing the use of 9-1 in ways that uh, uh, we are, are novel and uh, we're taking note of and bringing uh, uh, back east. Uh, one of the things that California is doing right now is bringing big data to 9-1. Uh, and they, they started with one county and they're expanding the statewide. Every night, one call gets registered at the geo location of, of where it's at. We've had that for some time now. But now they pull that into a, just that data data into a, a uh, that's not a four letter word now, is it? Is that data? Yeah. That data data is now shared uh, not only in the county EOC, but the state EOC. And it's compared against the daily average pattern of said you can have a spike in the morning for 911 calls and you can have a spike in the afternoon. and They've got then uh, rules set in that would say, hey, show me the, the anomalous uh, 911 calls. Uh, and that is leading to really amazing things that are kind of next gen 911 life. And, and I'll just give you an example to kind of uh, expand your, your thought about where we can and should be going with 911. Uh, imagine now if you're in a 911 call center. <coughs> Or if you're in the state, you know, you know merchant operation center, uh, and going through your, your daily thing, it's at uh, uh, 12:30 in the afternoon. You just have shift change, uh, and suddenly, boom! You get the alarm that there's anomalous an anomalous spike in your county in 911 calls. Uh, you then call up the the, the the map of 911 calls, and you say, well, where are they in ge geographic dispersion? Uh, and you see this annulus of calls uh, with no calls in the middle. And uh, now you're, you're, you're way different from the job of a 911 operator today, which is, uh, uh, hi, this is 911, uh, what's your emergency? And where are you? Uh, you're saying, look at that, I haven't gotten a call yet, uh, uh, but all my contemporaries have calls, uh, and they're all around, what's at the middle of that? Well, they have the systems now that uh, bring up what's at the middle. Oh, that's the chemical plant in my county. Uh, they could go right into the satellite image of what that looks like, and they know immediately, or they can deduce, that there's probably been an explosion at the chemical plant. There's probably fatalities at that chemical plant. I think there's any one calls there. Uh, 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 that the range of the uh, injuries from the kinetic part of the explosion are uh, a mile and a half out. Uh, I better get some trucks rolling to 
uh, 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 go support that. Uh, but hey, it's a chemical plant, so as I dispatch them, I'm going to include the uh, chem, chem bio guys uh, uh, with that. Uh, and the, uh, oh my goodness, it's a chemical plant. Let me bring in the weather. Uh, what are the winds doing? Let me bring in my plume module. Uh, uh, where is this thing spreading? That emergency alerting thing. Hey, let me get that going. Uh, the wireless emergency alert, uh, uh, I'm going to call. Uh, send out an alert that we uh, uh, could have toxic vapors headed your way. I, I don't want to get the entire county um, scared. Uh, when they don't need to be, because they may do the exact wrong thing. It may create panic. So I'm going to geo-target that alert to just the cell phones that are in the danger area for the plume. Uh, and would be hugely useful for a community that is responding to that kind of a disaster that we see every, you know, every month. We have things like that. Um, and you'd say, oh yeah, that's a nice dream. Well, you're uh, five years from now, 10 years from now. There's nothing that I just described, right? And is it possible to dig? We just have to connect the dots to, to bring this together. So uh, California is very focused on that. I can tell you they, they've got a vibrant uh, uh, discussion with uh, Oregon and uh, Washington uh, State. Um, so I, I think we're, we're uh, on the East Coast, we're, we're seeing a faster uptake of the parts of Next Gen 901 that are kind of part of the traditional plan. Right, and then I'm, I'm seeing that too. You know, yeah. We're starting to talk to some of these states about you know the values of resiliency in the network and so forth and half yeah. diversity and all that, but it's, it's amazing. In, in, in the commercial sales world, we use the word shoving instead of pushing. <laughs> we just wanted to... That's why you guys were so much more successful. Than I don't know about that. Yeah. 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 Just switch gears. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I'll oh, yeah. Go ahead. So, so, and, and it, it's a great piece when you're talking about FirstNet. You know, I was involved with FirstNet and Next Gen 911, and and then moving over to IT. But when we look at all of these changes, the amount of changes that have happened in the last five years, in comparison to the last 25, it's just exponential. Yes. Just, and I remember when we did land mobile radios and moved to narrow banding and how painful it was and how we should get everybody on board and to move over and then the money's allotted to be able to do that. How do you think we're going to be able to do all these changes in the next several years um, without the allotment of money that we might have had in the past? Well, it, a great question. Um, first, let me um, talk about narrow banding a little bit because we're responsible in my bureau for, for narrow banding. And, uh, yeah, technology has now allowed that you can uh, uh, replicate voice very effectively at uh, uh, base band that now is five kilohertz, maybe even less than or lower than five. Uh, uh, so that technological advance has allowed the ability to what used to take a 25k channel, but hey, let's put it up to 12 and a half. And I think the final part, part of narrow menu. Uh, says the three down to, to six or more seven. Uh, uh, because uh, that narrow banding plan uh, really came before FirstNet, uh, and uh, we're very conscious now that these local um, emergency communicators uh, that we're potentially putting in a position where, hey, we're to look at, you got to buy new radios for the 12 and a half. We, 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 now we got to buy new radios for the, the uh, even you know, half of that. Uh, and then you're going to tell us we've got to buy new radios for this first net thing. Uh, we uh, think that uh, it may be appropriate for us to slow down a little bit on the, on the uh, final narrow banding objectives. So we're, we're looking at that now uh, with an eye towards uh, we, we really want uh, local communities to have some investment capital uh, ready, or at least the potential to go back to the boards to say, I really need more money. Uh, I didn't come to you last year for the <laughs> their banding piece can give me money this year for that first time thing. Um, so that's the, the, the little bit that, that, that we're doing. Um, you know, nationally, the, the first implementation of uh, FirstNet is going to get that injection of billions of dollars uh, uh, from the auctions. Uh, so that's a, a piece to help. And I, I, I just got to tell you that, that there, I think we really need to look at this win-win between public and private, and 
you know, going back to what the, uh, Theodore Vail, who was the first head of AT&T, uh, uh, said early on, when he successfully, you know, think about when AT&T first got that, uh, uh, that monopoly, if you will, uh, for to run the nation's telecommunications. It, it was in a huge antitrust era. They were busting up the monopolies left and right, and took petroleum and said, you know, if you pump gas, you can't drill for gas, for oil. Um, he said, look, we're different telecommunications. We know we have a public responsibility uh, and uh, give us the opportunity to build out this national capability and we'll do it in a way that honors that, that public responsibility. I, I think that Sparity Tap Ale is still there in the communications market and uh, I'm certainly not advocating that uh, going back to a benevolent monopoly. Uh, I like the vigorous uh, competition in there, but uh, weaving in the, uh, hey, there's a public responsibility as we uh, uh, bring new functionality and make a significant dollars in the communications arena, let's make sure that there's a piece of that that is uh, bring along the, those enduring values uh, that uh, are, are really important in the concept. Is that? And it's just sure. Thank you. Yeah. yeah I, we were at UCOM, we were really involved in laying that foundation for command and control when it came to you know, cyber operations. Uh, so, in your role here in, in the FCC, what is the role of the FCC in cybersecurity and operations? It, it's a great question. Uh, thanks for the segue, because uh, 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 it was getting really hot under the uh, safety <laughs> communications player. Um, uh, first of all, before we leave public safety communications, cyber is critically important there. Uh, so, we are uh, working to, across the the community for public safety communications, uh, uh, bring in a consciousness uh, uh, for cyber and to, to uh, help them uh, address the most the, the clear and present danger uh, threats. An example is in emergency alerting. Um, anybody hear of the, the zombie attack on the emergency alerting system? One or two. Um, uh, emergency alerting, you know, because everything from the, the president's, it started out as the president's uh, uh, emergency alerting network, he should be able to, he or she, uh, should be able to, uh, uh, in a national crisis, be able to uh, get on the public airwaves and uh, uh, interrupt uh, every broadcast and say, hey, I, we have this issue. <laughs> Missiles inbound. I just want to tell you, I'm sorry that the treaty negotiations failed, but Dr. Cover. Uh, uh, so we've got this daisy chain, if you will. Not daisy chain, that's the best way to uh, kind of oh, chain yeah. reaction yeah. Uh, uh, ability to have uh, one station tell three others, and those three others tell nine others, and uh, it, uh, it gets out across the country. Um, a that. Uh, Waterfall, if you will, of the, the chain reaction uh, was hijacked uh, in a region uh, by uh, some pranksters, thankfully pranksters, uh, the day before, uh, a few years ago, uh, State of the Union address uh, that uh, figured out how to inject, uh, they just recorded the test codes, they uh, uh, played those co codes out. Uh, and seized in a classic man metal attack uh, the alerting system and played the uh, zombies are rising from their graves, uh, repent, and, and uh, 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 so it's kind of funny because, you know, it's like War of the Worlds, it really uh, didn't do any harm other than, the, you know, reputational harm to the government and their control of its resource. Uh, but it could have been much worse, right? It could have been that uh, a malicious actor who was seeking to generate the exact wrong community response uh, uh, to a, 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 a kinetic emergency. Um, when we did the deep dive on the systems associated with that, there were firewalls in the system. There was no uh, access control. They not only kept the same default password when they sent the modems out, at, they put that password on the web to say, hey, when you set your system up, here's the password. Uh, so there's this naivete 
in some of the communication uh, subsectors uh, for cyber that uh, we're working to say, look, you, you, you got to have, you, you got to know what the SANS 20 controls are, and maybe do at least five of them. Um, uh, that's at the the, um, the low end, the end probably greatest need, uh, but um, most specific granularity. At the high end, you know, for me to go to Comcast or Verizon and say, your cyber's not good enough, and I'm here to tell you from the FCC what you need to do to make your cyber better. Um, I, I probably don't have a lot of technical value to add to how uh, at companies that are living with this threat every single day and have successfully put together um, uh, programs to defeat it, uh, or at least, uh, um, uh, I don't think anyone wanted to defeat it, uh, uh, to, to be resilient and robust. Uh, I don't think it's the FCC's place to tell them uh, that you've got to follow the SAMS 20 controls. Um, however, uh, I also uh, believe that we have not uh, effectively in the telecommunications sector uh, universally um, achieved a uh, regular and repeatable assessment of cyber risk in a way that it gets into the C-suite in an understandable way and the C-suite then rationalizes investments uh, to mitigate cyber risks. Uh, uh, and uh, while there are some that are better than others, I would venture to say that Verizon is pretty good at that, uh, you know, Comcast is pretty good at that. Um, uh, they, it, 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 as you get smaller, mid and small and rural, um, it, it pretty quickly uh, degrades. Uh, and we need to have that ability to assess risk, uh, but then we also need to have the ability to communicate risk across the rest of the ecosystem. Uh, and the example that I'll use there is uh, Target and uh, the HVAC company that Target contract with. Uh, I would venture to say that uh, Target, in fact, I know they actually had a pretty robust cybersecurity program. And they're retail, they know that people are after their credit card numbers. Uh, and so their cyber audience was up here. That HVAC company they used, um, I'm not sure they could spell cyber. They had cyber readiness that was down here. When one part of Target decided they changed the way that they do HVAC and contract with a company that didn't really have a, a cyber program, there was not an effective communication of uh, accepted risk between Target and the HVAC company. Yet that HVAC company was given significant privileges in the network so that they could, in fact, do what Target asked them to do, manage my uh, AC and my uh, uh, here in each of my stores. Uh, so that's not that uncommon in the commercial world. And I, I'd ask if, if I'm wrong on that, you guys tell me, but I'm seeing North South head on. So uh, we have got to, I believe, uh, get to a better communication of risk uh, between not just corporate entities, but also government as well. And that comes to the, the federal and government piece. Right now, we've just been kind of trusting. Hey, we're relying on these, we're organizing public safety communications around these, markets around these. Um, are you doing the job? I don't know. Uh, uh, so there needs to be some degree of transparency in that risk discussion, the risk that's accepted, how it can be communicated with uh, others in the ecosystem. That communication, I believe, needs to also be with the organization's chart of oversight. Um, so we, uh, this year, developed the charter for working group four of the CISRIC, the Communication Security Reliability and Interoperability Council, our, our back of federal advisory committee, and said, uh, look, uh, a year from now, uh, and the, the timeline is uh, the end of spring, early summer next year, uh, we, Chairman Wheeler, is not going to be a status quo uh, with the acceptance of cyber risk uh, in the sector that he's charged with uh, protecting. Um, uh, and
and not protecting by doing the protection, but by creating the right environment and the right attention to this. It, it, it's, a, it's not on my watch, uh, and they, they know this. Uh, so the scissor group is charged with coming up with a uh, improved ability to assess risk with each of the companies, communicate that in the boardroom, and then to communicate it more broadly across the rest of the ecosystem. Uh, they're very clear on that, that challenge to them. Uh, and at the beginning of that, Chairman Weaver said, look, this is an opportunity for a new parallel. I'm asking you to, to effectively write the regulations by doing that voluntarily with yourselves in a way that is uh, demonstrable. We can see it. Uh, effective, it's making a change, uh, and if that happens, then our job is done. Right? We have regulated by convening, which is the way we like to regulate, uh, uh, because truly industry will be much more agile and capable of following the movements of the officer. But we're not going to be where we are, where we were last year, uh, uh, next year, uh, in a, uh, just letting this go on and amble uh, down the path of any knowledge of risk. If that doesn't happen, then uh, we're, we're very ready to say, okay, we, we really need to help you along a little bit and to uh, uh, mandate uh, some kind of assessment of risk uh, in, in the telecommunications sector. I, I tell you, uh, I believe industry is rising to the challenge. We've got uh, uh, Robert Mayer, who's working on, with, with his part of the working group, uh, to the operational initiation of the cybersecurity framework, the NIST framework, to the telco sector and putting that uh, uh, together in a way that is optimized for telecommunications companies. They've got a large committee, they've got a big and smallest committee, they've got a rural group. Uh, they're, they're really uh, doing great work on that. And it'll harmonize uh, what implementation would look like uh, in that group. Then we have uh, Bob Allen. Uh, who is the uh, uh, CISO or CTO from um, no, no, no. Uh, uh, one thing, not CES. A anyway, for, from uh, 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 Time Warner, um, who is working on the part of the problem that says, okay, uh, uh, boardrooms, uh, we've got this work going on in the framework. How does that get effectively communicate in your investment decisions uh, each year so that this just isn't a cost center that you're trying to minimize, uh, that you're, you're, you're really uh, uh, using that to, to, to gauge your corporate investment, and how do we then have that uh, be useful in that uh, multi-stakeholder uh, uh, communication and, and with, with the oversight group. Uh, the, what I've seen so far in some of the interim product uh, is, is really impressive. I think they absolutely understand that Chairman Wheeler is, look, if you don't do anything, you're, you're really forcing, you're tying the regulator's hands, uh, we're going to have to do something. They get it, and they're doing something, and so far it looks like it's going to be good. Is there another question? Uh, so, sorry, is there another question? <laughs> so, so I was just pulling up some of my notes from APCO, and one of the things that struck me that you said was in your Bureau and Commission goals was this transition to public infrastructure to all IP, and you had talked about trials that the FCC was going to do, and developing use cases. And so I think there is a lot of organizations here represented, and use case development is often a an excellent way to can't create, do everything. Have you gotten further down the path in terms of the trials and, and developing use cases? And yes. So the IP tech transition uh, uh, at the FCC is uh, defined really by the requirement for uh, Title II common carrier providers before they decommission uh, an element of the communications infrastructure, um, and I'm, I'm going out of that line to this legal talk, so you know, throw it in this array there or something. <laughs> um, uh, they have to request to shut a service down, so no longer can provide a service that before was governed by uh, the, uh, the, the commission, was regulated by the commission. So that applies to switched 
uh, TDM and uh, PSTN pods. Uh, for they can no longer do that and instead uh, uh, provide uh, voice communications and data communication in a non-switched architecture. Um, or, or I should say, before they can no longer commercially support the, the switch service, uh, they've got to get the, the commission's permission to do that. Well, their value proposition for going to the everything over IP world is tied to no longer having to pay to do switched operations. So there's a strong motivation for them to work with us to uh, help get to the point where we have fully replicated a comparable service uh, in that non-switched environment. And a comparable piece is really important that there are elements that you know we like to think of, hey, it's IP, it's all going to be better. Uh, anybody remember when we first tried to do VoIP? Uh, yeah. was, it, was it better out of the box? <laughs> no, <laughs> it wasn't. Uh, it's as good now, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in many ways better uh, uh, now. Uh, in, in, in more than that. Uh, lots of ways better. Uh, but it, it took time to get there. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they did a great job. Uh, so um, the uh, commission was approached by AT&T said, okay, look, we, we got it. You, you're 214. Uh, we got to ask permission to shut down that switch service. We really need to do that because our, our numbers don't work financially if we, if we can't shut that down. We like to propose uh, some trials by which we would work as we see with you directly in a couple of communities. And uh, uh, as you identify barriers, as we together identify uh, barriers to getting that comparable service, uh, we're able to solve them in a way that then is scalable more broadly across the rest of our 214 applications. So uh, the commission considered that, put together, uh, instead of just for AT&T, said, no, this really should apply across uh, the entire communication sector. So we've got a management framework that has been approved for trials associated with the IP tech transition. Uh, and the first two trials, uh, AT&T going to everything over IP in um, oh, Carbon Hill, Alabama, and there's another location in Florida, uh, have, have been approved and we're working with AT&T AT on that. There are other applications now for trials, uh, and we're, uh, 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 I really can't talk about the different companies that are now working to do the same thing to facilitate their 214, or if there's gray area to say, look, I don't know, I was going to kind of uh, contend that we didn't need to do a 214, but now that we've got this trial thing, how about we work on that together? Um, that is well underway. The specifics of the, the IP tech transition really have at least three elements to them. Uh, one is that transition from switch to IP. Two is the retirement of copper uh, in favor of fiber uh, in many locations, fiber to the home, fiber, fiber to the businesses. And the third is kind of a leapfrog. Hey, as I retire copper, I really want to go to, to fixed wireless uh, in areas where it's just not cost effective for me to dig a trench and, and put the uh, fiber, even though at one point it was cost effective to put copper all the way out to that home. So uh, there are uh, potential issues with all three of those uh, that we're working out in those two communities. Uh, and uh, a, a, a big piece of that includes the failure modalities change uh, in all those. They're not always um, more robust. In some failure modalities, they're less robust. So how you mitigate for that with redundancy or mesh uh, is, is a key piece. Some of their mitigations involve mesh uh, which means then that there are cyber threat vectors that um, maybe wouldn't be in consideration for, uh, and, and a lot of uh, uh, issues associated with, hey, I'm wireless now. Um, what happens after the tornado or after the <laughs> hurricane? Uh, so uh, those are the kind of issues we're working through with the IP uh, uh, tech transition that the Trump is associated with. Thank you. Did, did that, yes. So I have a question of curiosity. 
Notice it's not as see as you. But to go down this path and look at what happens to the end user. I haven't heard anything, I mean, not been out this for a while, but WEPs and GETs, those systems, you know, you just carry your car with you, you get your presence, you get through on a switch network with the GETs, right? And then WEPs has it. What's. I'm like y'all. Yeah. Okay, so, so put it on the same blank film. This is a GETs card, right? Uh, and uh, a web saying gets card. Uh, gets uh, gives you, uh, if you're a designated uh, government official uh, with a response responsibility, uh, then the government has contracted with the carriers to say uh, if there's any remaining infrastructure, that call will have prioritization over uh, all the other calls uh, that aren't gets as calls. The same thing is contracted by number of wireless providers uh, in the WPS program. Uh, so what these, priority are you now, sir? Paul <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> frankly, uh, I, my greatest concern is not what priority I have, it's that this has significant shortfalls because this right now is uh, predicated near entirely on switched uh, routing. Uh, and it doesn't, that partition doesn't carry over. The first time that comes in, jumps into an IP world, the partition had lost. <laughs> it's not that uh, carried forward. So we are behind the curve in government and in industry uh, in determining how we will conduct priority services, prioritization of uh, critical emergency communications in a uh, all, all IP environment, uh, even high, highly, you know, half IP uh, uh, switched environment. <coughs> um, uh, we are a part of the NSEP Executive Committee, uh, National Security Emergency Preparedness Communications Executive Committee. It is chaired by, uh, I guess, not Chair Halverson. Uh, we're going to have the first meeting with him uh, since he's uh, taken over in a couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, by, it has been by Steph Lee, although I think it's going to bump up uh, probably to uh, Andy Osmond. I'm not, I'm not sure. But anyway, Gage S and DOD uh, co chair that with uh, the other key agencies in the federal government. Uh, and underneath that, we have a priority services working group uh, that is charged with. Uh, okay, uh, how, how are we going to get that transition from WPS and GETs into uh, uh, an IP world? Um, we are way behind the curve. We don't even have the directory piece of how, you know, how would you assign attributes to individuals in a way that, that crosses, you know, so, so it's like that first net challenge. We are a little further along in that we've got uh, the PIV cards and mm -hmm. CAT cards, uh, so uh, we should have the director structure we can drop on. But to get that recognized in a way that, that translates across the fabric of providers, both wireless and uh, switch, and a uh, landline uh, is uh, work to do this year. Is that primarily voice oriented? Well, yeah. It, well, anything yes. Else? But, uh, uh, gets and WPS was started with voice and light. Yeah. Uh, will that be where we go from here? Uh, uh, yeah, I would think that, that if we start to do load shedding, uh, if the surviving infrastructure is so saturated, we want to have the ability to go down to, hey, only trucks get through. Uh, uh, so that's in the art of the possible. Yeah, and that's what happens when you're. Like on my mobile phone, if I'm in an extended area um, in the middle of nowhere, it, it, I can't get voice calls, but I can do texts. Right? So they, they have the technology set up already to be doing that. Um, good. So you guys won't be putting in any of the directory services with that company in Colorado. <laughs> uh, it's a big company that has a lot of the 901 market. So, uh, yeah. Well, sir, as we wrap up, I, I'm curious, our government colleagues that are here in the room, do you have questions and, or comments? Yeah, I'm 
comments or areas. We, we certainly, this isn't the last of a conversation. This is actually just the beginning of a conversation. We'd like to, we have 500 plus members in that kayak that represent all dimensions of uh, uh, the community, plus the uh, American Council for Technology is the government side, so it is a government industry partnership and we do work together on issues that are uh, beneficial to the government. It's not important to the government, but it's not important to the organization. So we'd like to, uh, I'd like to ask, um, just as way of teeing up what we could do next, what are some of the, you know, I know we don't have much time, but we could have another discussion. What would the discussion be on? And what would be valuable for the community to talk about so that we can not just have a one time, but but move the needle a little bit. Is that? I'm kind of trying to work with the FAA. Um, I've been working in emergency management, and I serve on a working group at the PMISE looking at alerts and warnings and um, R5 interoperability among the agencies. And the alerts, and warnings, and notifications group was given a charter, you know, do this better among the agencies. And frankly, I'm probably speaking out of school, but frankly, they're not really sure what the problem is that's you know trying to be solved. The FEMA system does a, a fair job of getting notifications out to the public, so it's in interagency shared notifications. Do you have any insight into where there are particular issues with that interagency? Yeah, it, it's a great question. Um, one, there's the security. Uh, element to it. it mm -hmm. It's not as secure as it needs to be. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, two, it's a, it's a resource that is under undervalued, uh, and we think that the difference in the way alerting is set up in the country from the, everything over IP for everything else uh, really needs to be recognized as we go forward so that we don't inadvertently dissemble that uh, while we uh, you know, love the fact that we have LTE everywhere, and uh, because it truly is a diverse technology that allows that rapid communication from one to many uh, in a way that where there's a successful cyber attack into the IP backbone of the nation, I, I think we really want that alerting capability to be different and to uh, uh, continue to survive. And now, there are some intersect points uh, already now with the IP and alerting. Uh, so we're already there in introducing risk to that. Uh, and and it, it, we want to make sure that we preserve the, uh, where it can be independent and diverse, uh, that we pre preserve the thin line for that. Um, the uh, final thing is that uh, we just kind of scraps the surface with what we can do with the learning. Uh, uh, we can do a whole lot more. Uh, I uh, spoke Monday, actually, I've asked to, to come talk to the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, uh, the president of NPR and the, the president for, uh, for PBS uh, and their uh, uh, board members at, at the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. They're very concerned at, uh, about um, the, the future of broadcasting. And they really want to understand that what could be with the learning. When you think about what we do today with the wireless of a learning, um, we have the ability now to send tornado warnings, not to a whole county. So the whole county will say, oh, here's another warning. You know, every time I do this, I go to that, and nothing ever happens. Uh, now, when those warnings go out, when those warnings go out, they are geo targeted. It doesn't cause your cell phone to do its thing unless the National Wildlife Service has had the top of the radar in your exact spot in case there's going to be a tornado there. So it's huge in that now people are, are really paying attention to, oh, hey, that alert came. I, I better go do something because the guy who didn't do it last time didn't survive. Uh, it also means that instead of uh, in Missouri, every home in the state Every time there's a weather forecast with tornadoes in the area, uh, you know, just forget your night. Uh, everyone's going to shelter. Now, uh, a huge chunk of the state that would otherwise have gone to shelter 
continues to function and operate because they're not getting an alert because it is targeted to just the area that's going to get it. We, it's only the weather service really that has taken advantage of that geotargeting aspect of alerting. Uh, there's a huge potential for not just a geotargeting of alerting, but imagine, uh, uh, and don't write this word down, uh, uh, it will be misconstrued. Demographic targeting. But when I mean demographic targeting, I mean if you self identify in your phone that you're a diabetic and you're taking insulin, uh, if the who's in the health and human health and human services department uh, gets the word that hey, a batch of insulin was just let out uh, and it hit the supply chain and it is bad, it will kill you if you take that insulin. They can send that alert out, and everybody who self-identified as a guy who takes in, or a gal who takes insulin gets the same alert uh, and says, "Hey, look at your bottle. Don't don't inject that insulin." Uh, you know, that may be a cheesy example, but there's all sorts of examples that y'all can think about where we would be able to uh, really improve our utilization of alerting resources uh, in a way that would have great societal value. We also have the ability, to, the public broadcaster would particularly interested in this, uh, in the next standard for television, uh, which is television broadcasting, uh, ATSC 3.0, uh, to uh, uh, radically change the way that, that broadcast TV is done so that it is IP oriented and has that uh, feedback loop so that while broadcast is always one to many, it has the ability to many to one kind of crowdsourcing back uh, uh, in, in a way that uh, alerting. Right now, you get a, a Amber alert, right? Uh, some people that actually causes some people to turn off alerting, which is a shame. Uh, but we've got to figure out how to use this responsibly. Uh, but imagine if you also then have the ability to. Uh, oh, I see someone who fits that description. Um, to click on something and that feedback. And immediately go go back to uh, the you know public safety entities. Uh, that that would be huge. So that big data that I talked about with 911. Imagine if you started getting those some of those sightings. You know you can't connect the name one, but you get three or four of those. You're saying, hey, that's hot. Let's get you know assets rolling uh, uh, towards that area. Um, so uh, uh, I do think that there's significant upside. Uh, to uh, alerting, if we think about alerting as not just a one-to-many, but the, the one-to-many can to that with a many-to-one uh, component. Thank you. With the FAA, the biggest concern today for me is uh, cell phones on planes. <laughs> so we're working closely with the FAA to, to uh, kind of shift the who gets to decide about whether it's safe to use cell phones on planes or not, uh, because there's Technically, no longer a reason not to use cell phones on planes. Uh, it's really a security and an etiquette kind of thing. So we're working with the FAA, DOT, and the security uh, agencies to uh, say, "Okay, over to you guys," because <laughs> it's no longer a frequency issue. So, government colleagues, any last questions? I just have one quick one. You mentioned cyber before. I'm sure. Sure. Specifically, that FCC's one of FCC's roles is to help assess and communicate of, of the threat or the, such the environment that we're in. Is maybe one of the other roles, since it's one of the few independent agencies that has a stake in the game, like the FTC and the SEC, to maybe help with respect to incentives, since the FCC knows this market better than anyone, um, can help those stakeholders understand how to do it in a way that is not necessarily redundant or burdensome, or maybe similar avoiding some of the pitfalls that the federal government has been stuck in dealing with the old certification and accreditation paradigm that it's trying to move away from now. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, uh, we believe that uh, a generation of market accountability uh, for accepted cyber risk uh, is not just unique to our sector, it really touches upon all the other sectors. So we are working now with the other regulators to start up a interregulators cyber forum uh, that would uh, allow us all to begin to make each other aware of our activities within the cyber arena and harmonize that regulatory activity in, in the cyber world. Um, I think
think in harmonizing the activity, while it, it may not be a direct incentive in the way of, hey, you get a tax break, you can get this, you can get that. Uh, I think the ability to avoid regulatory prescriptive guidance on in, in silos that try to solve the entire cyber problem around a single sector, that uh, that will provide strong incentive to uh, companies that begin to say, okay, I, I see now that you're not trying to put the cyber problem not all on our backs, uh, that through that harmonized regulatory activity, uh, the carriers have a role in this, the uh, nuclear power plants uh, have a role in how they conduct their computer operations, the providers of computers uh, governed under the uh, FTC uh, and, and have a role in, in you know, improving uh, host page protections, uh, and uh, you know, all private companies uh, have an increased responsibility for reporting as material uh, cyber shortfalls. So that's the piece I'm most excited about, that, that pulling the other regulators together and saying, hey, let's not do these in a vacuum, uh, and let's be as clear as we can to our regulated entities uh, in a way that each of your regulated entities also can see uh, so that there's clarity as we go forward uh, in how that risk is uh, divided up between the different sectors. Yeah, I mean, from a legal standpoint, I, mean, I think one of the things that uh, the private sector is struggling with is, right, you're going to tell me to do this. Is that going to be considered reasonable? Or is that a, is that enough to be, satisfy um, my stockholders or, or those that might file lawsuits against me? It's so sufficient if, criteria. Absolutely. So if you've got a regulator that that's sufficient, that meets the that, the community standard, if you will, then that goes a long way to helping companies make the case as to why you should be doing this. Yeah, it's huge. And so, you know, when I first came to the SEC, I said, hey, where is this really working well? I'm thinking it would be the communications information sharing and balance this center. Mm -hmm. And the COM ISAC, not so much. The best ISAC is in the financial sector, the FS ISAC. They're really sharing critical information about the threat and they see that the, the threat to one is really a threat to all uh, and reputational damage to the market, the financial sector market, has huge cost to all of them. So they found the win-win. We haven't successfully found the win-win in the comm sector yet and a number of other sectors. Uh, so we, through the uh, work with the other regulators and within our own sector, uh, we hope to begin to answer that. I don't think it's completely removing uh, liability protections uh, uh, from uh, uh, companies that uh, in the comm sector that would say, oh yeah, no, share, because you'll never be sued for that. Uh, uh, that would kind of fly in the face of generating a market accountability for a perfect cyber investment. Uh, but finding that better sweet spot, that win-win uh, uh, that uh, cultivates uh, sharing between uh, companies among threat and between sectors uh, I think uh, is a huge uh, priority. Thank you. Thanks. Well, thank you, everybody. I think that was a great way to end. Sir, thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming today. We'll be in touch. Um,